So in terms of Stridor, um, this is what we're going to be covering and this is, these are basically your learning objectives. So um, I think it's really important when thinking about Stridor um, and any really clinical presentation is really knowing the anatomy and physiology so that you can apply that to the child that you're seeing in front of you. Um, and so we're very, very briefly going to cover that. In reality, um, there's a lot of detail of pediatric airway anatomy, and that is a topic in itself, and I'm happy to give that talk if you guys are keen to do that. In terms of clinical evaluation, that's both um, sort of history taking and examination, which we'll go through an MLB and how to prepare for an MLB, and then going through the common congenital and the inquired causes. So in terms of me, complex, each intricate bit of the anatomy, but essentially, uh, particularly the airway um, side of things is really looking at the supraglottis, glottis, subglottis, and down into the trachea and bronchi where it splits into right and left uh, bronchus. So that's the bit that we'll be covering it in terms of looking at pathology and causes for stridor. I think it's important to know that uh, the respiratory epithelium is lined with ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium and that the cilia usually um, beat upwards so that um, mucus can be tracked up into the mouth where it's then swallowed or spat out. Um, there are specific glands that are more common in the upper respiratory tract uh, and as we get lower down into the uh, bronchi bronchioles, it, they, they then become absent. And the goblet cells, compared to glands, there are still scattered ones in the first bronchioles compared to the glands. Um, so this is a video of a normal MLB, and that's really just to show you, um, I'm going to uh, stop and start it just to go through things. And that's really what we look at on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of a normal MLB. So just um, hopefully you'll be able to uh, see uh, what I'm doing. So you've got the uh, epiglottis here, uh, and then you've got the two vocal cords, and you've got the arytenoids at the back, and obviously this is the uh, cricoid, uh, post cricoid area here, uh, where obviously the esophagus comes down. Um, and that's the view that we see normally. Um, in terms of, I'm just going to start the video. So um, So just looking down, looking at the vocal cords, making sure they're nice and smooth. Um, often we don't get movement, although you can see a little bit of uh, vocal cord movement. And then going into the subglottis, okay? Uh, so looking for any lesions or swellings, going all the way down so you can see the tracheal rings uh, at the top, and then you have the tracheolus muscle uh, along the bottom. Uh, and then we, with the scope, we go all the way down to where the um, the right and main bronchus splits off, and the carina is that area where it splits off into the two areas. Okay, so that's just really just to give you an overall idea of the anatomy that we're talking about. Um, so, um, so I think it's important to again differentiate between the pediatric and the adult airway, um, and the reason why that's important is because. Obviously, the pediatric airway is much, much smaller than the adult one. So any swelling or effect will have a much larger impact overall um, on the um, uh, on the pediatric, uh, on the child compared to an adult. So the average diameter of the subglottis in a full-term baby is around 3.5 millimeters to 7 millimeters in an adolescent and 10 to 14 millimeters in an adult. I think there's, it's important to also be aware of that there are other aspects that are very different. So between the infant and um, the adult, so the head is much, much larger. The occiput is much more prominent. So in terms of positioning the head and talking about the MLB, uh, that's important in terms of getting the best view possible. The tongue is relatively larger compared to the adults and the larynx sits much higher. So C23 vertebrae compared to C46 in an adult. We often talk about uh, an amoeba-shaped epiglottis, and I'm going to show you an example of that a bit later on. Um, and in an adult, it's much more flat and flexible. So your, your view is much better in an adult when you look from the top compared to a, a, a tiny baby. The vocal cords are usually very short and concave, uh, and in adults, they're a lot flatter um, and horizontal. 
in children, as we mentioned, the quicoid ring um, is, is uh, quite a, a tight area, it's the tightest area, um, and the cartilages uh, around the arytenoids are much softer and also the trachea. So again, we'll talk about sort of things that can, can cause pathology from that side of things. Um, and the lower airway is smaller and less developed. Okay. So um, this is just an image really, as I mentioned that the, the pediatric airway is much smaller and as we get uh, older, our airway increases, but any amount of swelling can have a huge impact on the overall uh, diameter of the airway. So if children are unwell uh, with a viral illness, their airway will be considerably uh, smaller. So just thinking very quickly about neonates, um, uh, the physiology, again, that's, I think, really important to be aware of. That's, again, a brief um, uh, thing that we're going to mention here. So neonates have a much higher rate of oxygen comp uh, consumption compared to adults, um, and their lung capacity is much smaller. And so they're much uh, less uh, able to tolerate apnea. However, they have increased compliance, and that's why children, uh, in children that we do MLBs, they're able to uh, ventilate spontaneously and breathe spontaneously. So just thinking about the stridulous child, just thinking back, I mean, not even thinking back, um, I would say that's probably one of the scarier things um, to get called to in A&E or to see because um, often parents are very anxious. The child is making lots and lots of noises and it's a very, um, I think, anxious time to make sure that we do everything possible and right for the patient that we assess how severe something is, where the obstruction is, and then go ahead and manage it. So the first thing that we do with any child is, is to just, you know, observe just to see what's happening and what they're like and how they are behaving um, and the severity of the airway obstruction. Um, sometimes the less noisy they are, the more severe the obstruction is, obviously. So um, it, even though you may think that the noisier they become, the less the obstruction is actually can work in the other way. So as children tie or the obstruction is quite significant, their, their flow uh, is, becomes reduced. So in terms of history taking, it's important to, to find out the age of the onset. So if it's a uh, sudden presentation or a gradual onset, the severity and, and whether that severity fluctuates and the progression, is it something that's progressively happening or does it start and stop? It's important to learn about feeding and the impact uh, that the airway has on feeding and also by saying that it can also affect their ability to gain weight and, and thrive. Children can choke and cough so that can directly be impacted by their airway and they can also have a cyanotic spells or, or death spells. It can affect their sleep overall and they can look like they're working very, very hard and that can lead to failure to thrive ultimately. There can be positional aspects. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and also aggravating factors, as we said, uh, feeding, position, sleep and so on. I said feeding twice there. Feeding is very important. In terms of the examination, um, I think it's important to really understand the type of noise. Parents often struggle to describe exactly the type of noise that the children have, but it's important to really establish the type of stride or it is, because that will really help you in terms of knowing exactly where the obstruction is. And that's where the anatomy is really gonna be helpful because you can kind of picture in your head where the problem arises where there's any sturtle, which is much more of an upper airway obstruction uh, around the pharynx um, and oropharynx and nasopharynx, um, and evidence of increased work of breathing, as we said. And the, and the things that I look for, tracheal tug, any sternal recession, subcostal recession. Um, in terms of the MLB, we've obviously seen this, this video. I think it's important to remember that an MLB is not just um, a diagnostic tool, it can be done at the same time, used as a treatment um, options. And treatment, again, is something that is um, such a huge topic, um, talking about each, uh, each thing. Um, and we can talk, that in a bit, uh, talk about that in more detail. Uh, but there are lots and lots of endoscopic and open treatment options. In terms of the MLB, I think it's important to have all the necessary equipment for you to be very familiar with everything that you need um, and really to um, 
uh, to be able to set up a bronchoscope, for example, uh, and have the appropriate size instruments for the child that you're dealing with. So, for example, there is there are often well there is a chart um, with all the appropriate. Uh, endotracheal tubes, the appropriate bronchoscopes, and those are things that you need to familiarize yourself uh, in your hospital. Uh, and also, if you don't have it in your hospital, uh, to, to, to have a chart at hand yourself so that you can refer to it in emergencies. I think in terms of doc documentation, we, we um, talk, talked about um, sort of the bits that we will look at during the MLB, but it's important to document each particular thing that you're looking at um, and it's a process that we usually go through and it's something that we routinely look at all the different bits so we look at the superglottis the glottis the subglottis we take photos along each step we go down the trachea to the carina we often look at the right and left main bronchuses if we can and we look at a dynamic view of the vocal cords and often we do that at the end of the operation when the child is waking up unless they've already had one when uh, a dynamic view when they've been awake. We palpate the joints um, and we also exclude a cleft larynx and a TOF as potential causes if the primary reason for why, um, uh, for why uh, children are having airway problems may be to do with associated with feeding as the primary uh, symptom there. And we observe for any laryngomalacia uh, at the same time. And usually we do that right at the beginning because of the phase of anesthetic during that time. So we already kind of went through that, but just to, to really picture it in your mind and going through as you go down, uh, it's important just to capture each bit. And each bit is really gonna be helpful in terms of not only you planning in the future and recording, but also to speak to the parents and discuss exactly what you found if, there are, if, there, if you have found anything abnormal there. So in terms of the common congenital um, causes of stridor, there are lots, as you can see. So laryngomalacia being the most common one, um, and follow up uh, vocal cord paralysis, subglottic stenosis, laryngeal webs and atresia, uh, subglottic hemangioma, laryngeal clefts, tracheomalacia, tracheal stenosis. So there are lots and lots of different, um, different causes for stridor. Um, in terms of stride, um, laryngomalacia, just to mention it, it is the most common one. So it, cause, it, it accounts for about 60% of all the congenital uh, causes of stride. So it's something that we see, uh, and almost certainly if you haven't seen, you will see uh, in your career on a relatively regular basis. Um, it's the most common cause of stride in newborns, uh, and males are uh, two to one more predisposed to that than females. In the textbook, it usually says it starts around between two and four weeks, but parents often notice it the day or the day after uh, uh, the child is born. Um, and that uh, can be either intermittent or much more persistent. Um, and there are different severities of laryngomalacia. So the, the mild to moderate form accounts for approximately 80%, uh, while the severe is 15 and very severe is the, a one to 3%. And we'll talk about laryngomalacia in a bit more detail. Uh, a little bit later. Uh, in terms of the acquired causes, um, there are again lots of different ones. The post intubation uh, injuries by far outweigh any other cause uh, for um, stridor, and that causes subglottic stenosis. Um, so it can cause uh, supraglottic uh, minor lesions and edema, uh, as well as glottic swelling. Uh, and as well as pressure uh, induced ischemia, and it can cause subglottic um, swelling, ulceration, uh, both anteriorly and posteriorly, but very, uh, very commonly posterior laterally. In terms of other causes, they can be infective causes. So one of the things that I always asked about is about epiglottitis, and that's something that we all have to be aware of, but it actually in the pediatric population is not as common as it used to be. Uh, croup is very, very common, laryngitis, and deep neck space infection, so retropharyngeal abscesses, parapharyngeal abscesses with, uh, with extension. Those are the things that we have to think about an infective uh, cause for the um, stridal. Um, and then in terms of laryngeal trauma, so that can be either blunt or penetrating, inhalational injuries and caustic injuries. So again, they are much less common, but important to be aware of in terms of any differential diagnosis or any patient that you go to see. 
Um, there's also the neoplastic um, side of things. We don't see very many here at Evelina, um, but it's, it's important to be aware of. Uh, so the malignant um, neoplastic account for about 2% and they're usually the rhabdomyosarcomas and the benign are about 98%. Uh, and they're usually respiratory, um, recurrent respiratory papillomas and subglottic hemangiomas. So in terms of the treatment, as I said, that's a huge topic in itself, but there are three main uh, arms, management arms, and in anyone who's doing their exams, you have to uh, sort of clearly identify which part of uh, the management you're in and, and which part you are thinking about. So surgical tracheostomy is one of the things that can either be the first and most acute uh, life-saving treatment that can be applied, uh, but equally it's, it's a more of a, a later down the line treatment. Um, so that can be, depending on the severity of the symptoms, uh, can, be, can be applied at any time. In terms of um, endoscopic airway surgery, uh, that's performed very, very commonly, particularly here. Uh, and that in itself can not just, as I said, not just the diagnostic uh, endoscopy, but also involving cold steel, uh, laser microdebridings, balloon dilatation, um, uh, curblation. There's lots of different techniques um, in terms of applying endoscopic uh, airway surgery. And then finally, open airway surgery. And again, that's, uh, there's lots of different options from that point of view. So LTRs, CTRs, um, and, as I said, anterior posterior, posterior LTRs, tracheal resections, and so on. So what I want to do is really to go through clinical cases. It's a little bit difficult doing it via Zoom because obviously I can't see you. Um, but um, what I will do, if that's okay, is to go through a clinical case um, and then um, I'll talk through each one, if that's okay with you. Um, at the end, if there's anything that you want to ask me, of course, we can go back and go through things. So um, this is the first case. So it's a two-month-old male who presents uh, with inspiratory uh, stridor since birth, maybe a few hours or a day afterwards, but his parents noticed that that was the case. He actually uh, attended clinic, um, and the reason for that is because he was getting worse with increased work of breathing. He was not gaining weight, and mum was really struggling to breastfeed, so he was taking sort of hours and hours to feed, both in the day and at night, which was exhausting for them. Um, and he had a normal cry. So the things that um, makes me think straight away, uh, we talked about uh, laryngomalacia as being the main cause, um, and it's something that we see on a, a very, very regular basis. The things that I look at is, is the age of the child, the onset, so when it started, so on around birth. So, yep. Um, uh, um, birth, um, and also uh, the fact that it's getting worse. So that sort of is a red flag for me in terms of getting worse, not really gaining weight, difficulty feeding. So that means that whatever is happening is getting a little bit worse. Um, so the way that I would uh, normally uh, examine a child like that is I would, um, after taking a history, I would normally uh, listen out for the stride or I would look uh, for any tracheal tug or subcostal recession. So I normally ask his parents to take the top off to have a look at those things, auscultate the chest. Um, I always examine the nasopharynx and oropharynx. Uh, and then ideally we would want to pass the flexible nasal endoscopy uh, camera to have a look at the larynx. And that's really the only way to 100% um, uh, diagnose laryngomalacia, although we diagnose it uh, and not always, not, not everybody is uh, flexiscoped. So I'm just going to show you the first uh, video. Hopefully you'll be able to see. So you can see the leaf-shaped, uh, omega-shaped epiglottis. And it's sort of being sucked in, if you can see. So there's the front uh, bit being sucked in, as well as the back, the arytenoids uh, also being sucked in. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Uh, and the second video is actually after an endoscopic uh, treatment, so he, um, he's had an area of glottoplasty. Uh, the fact that actually you can see it's not sucking in, you can clearly see the vocal cords. I think uh, one of my colleagues impressed with me. I think it's important um, to um, to really decide on 
severity and whether somebody needs treatment, not based on what you can actually see physically, but on the history. Um, and in pediatrics, uh, that's probably one of the deciding uh, factors of, of how severe something is. It's, it's not necessarily looking uh, that we can decide if it looks really, really bad and we take them to theatre. It's much more the fact that it's becoming worse, they're working hard, they're not feeding well. Okay, so the next uh, case is a two month old female. Uh, they've had cardiac surgery approximately a week ago um, and they've had intermittent stride or uh, noticed immediately post op. Um, actually, the speech and language therapist who are looking after the child on the ward have found that um, she's coughing and choking on her feeds and she has quite a weak cry and she now requires energy feeding. So that's something that, again, we, we get um, a call to not that. Uh, not that rarely um, to see children and uh, to assess them and pass a camera down to have a look and see what's happening. Um, so the things that I would look at in terms of the history, obviously the age, uh, I think one of the things that would really flag up for me is the fact that they've had recent cardiac surgery and that can be involved with certain comorbidities and certain risks, uh, including damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The fact that they've had intermittent stridor actually may have been because of the vocal cord um, movement, but also it can be to do with the tube being in place during the surgery itself. So it may or may not be a significant thing to, to bear in mind. I think the significant thing is that they're coughing and choking and so they're not able to fully protect the airway uh, and that they're having to be NG fed. Unfortunately, I don't have a photograph uh, or a video of a vocal cord palsy to show you because we normally do them on the wards. Um, but I hope that you all would have seen a vocal cord uh, palsy, either unilateral or bilateral. Um, but that's really the diagnosis that would make me think uh, about, uh, that, that, that this case would make me think about. Um, in terms of uh, vocal cord palsies, I think it's important to unilateral and bilateral, congenital um, and acquired. So we obviously we're talking about an acquired uh, situation here, but you can have congenital um, a vocal cord palsy and that can either be unilateral or bilateral. Um, in terms of the unilateral uh, causes, uh, that's a much more common um, is the second most common uh, cause for stridor and it accounts for about 15 to 20 percent. With the unilateral uh, side it's more frequent uh, in terms of uh, as I said because of cardiac surgery or esophageal surgery uh, but it, it can be congenital as well and tracheostomies are rarely needed for those patients in terms of managing the airway. Uh, and often they just settle down without needing anything else. We would normally observe those children. They would receive speech and language therapy and their voice and their ability to protect the airway improves as time goes on. With bilateral vocal cord palsy, um, the stridor uh, is much more noticeable, often high pitched and can be associated with apnea, spells and cyanosis. Um, so as we talked about, it can be congenital, it can be due to trauma, uh, and it can also be idiopathic. In the bi bilateral vocal palsy, I think it's important to bear in mind that tracheostomies uh, can, can be needed in 50 to 60% of those children. So uh, often we sort of try to see how they manage without, uh, but if they are having cyanotic spells or, or death spells, um, then they, or apneic spells, then they, they do end up needing to have a tracheostomy to try and protect the airway. Um, because there's obviously very, very much narrowing of the airway when it's bilateral vocal cord palsy. We wouldn't usually consider any other surgical intervention until they're at least two, two years after the injury or, or, or the vocal cord palsy has been identified. And again, I think that's important to be aware of as uh, reinnovation uh, re is starting to pick up. Um, we would uh, watch and wait for a period of time. So I'm just going to move on, if that's okay, to the next case. So this is an eight-month-old female uh, presented to the uh, uh, to the clinic with recurrent episodes of croup. Um, each episode requiring steroids to settle, um, but never needed intubating and ventilating for any episodes born at term via normal vagina delivery and did not require any input during birth, no respiratory distress or anything else. So I'm just going to show you 
uh, the video. Um, and obviously looking, and you can always recognize as you do more and more airway surgeries, the normal anatomy, um, and, and, and then be able to identify the abnormal anatomy. So eventually we'll go down and you'll be able to have a look. So you can see the vocal cords clearly on either side, but just medially to that, you can start to see in coming into view that there's some elliptical round swelling uh, and <clears throat> some stenosis underneath the subglottis. And I hope you can all see that. That's not quite how it should look. And with congenital subglottic stenosis, which is what that is, it often is elliptical like that. Um, and then beyond that, it all looks okay. Um, the reason why children often present with recurrent episodes of croup is because any swelling actually causes that area to become even more narrow and then they often struggle a lot more. So the things again that we would look for is in, is in the history really, the recurrent croup, the age of the child, um, any past medical history, any previous intubation ventilation. Those are very, very significant things because sometimes you can have uh, congenital, sort of acquired on congenital uh, subglottic stenosis. Okay. So the next case uh, is a three month old male. Uh, he's had recurrent episodes of bronchiolitis and actually required intubation and ventilation on PICU on two separate occasions. He's now been readmitted with increasing biphasic stridal. And um, <clears throat> when he was born, he was an ex prem 26 weeker and he spent about a month on NICU. Uh, but otherwise has been has been fine uh, apart from these recurrent episodes of bronchiolitis and in between those episodes he's actually not had any stride or not no other issues um, and has managed to maintain his weight so i'm just going to show you this uh this video just for comparison so you can see again the vocals very pale and you can see this um cystic narrowing um which is circumferential you can see all the way uh, quite low down and then beyond that you can see a perfectly normal trachea uh, and hopefully you can all see that so we look all the way down just to check and see that's all okay uh, but in the subglottic area there's definitely uh, that circumferential area and the reason why I've put those two uh, presentations next to each other is really just to compare what subglottic stenosis um, in a congenital patient looks like versus somebody who's had recurrent intubations uh, and that's the trauma that we talk about in terms of um, in terms of ca causing subglottic, uh, subglottic scarring. And the way to minimize that is careful intubation, uh, not to uh, use a, a too large a size of a tube, uh, not to use a balloon unless it's necessary for the, uh, for the ET tube, um, and to keep the tube in uh, for as le least time as possible um, so that we minimize any trauma to the airway. And often children are, um, sedated again so that they're not pulling on the tube or moving the tube or self extubating okay so unfortunately i don't have any videos of laryngeal web but i thought this is important for you guys particularly uh people doing the exam because that's something again that can come up in the exam uh, and really being able to differentiate differentiate between the different types of laryngeal web. It's very rare, um, but it's important um, to, to really know about it. So there's type one um, laryngeal web, which is uh, approximately 35, less than 35% of the glottic length, type two, 35 to 50, type three, 50 to 75, uh, and then type, type four is 75 to 90. So you can see how far, and, and really in terms of the management, it really depends on which part of the, which, um, which stage, which type they get, that, that they have. So in somebody who has a type four um, uh, uh, laryngeal web, they may need to be uh, born via exit procedure. Um, they may need a tracheostomy straight away. Um, some the, the patients who have a type one laryngeal cleft may just have a little bit of a hoarse voice uh, without too much bother otherwise in terms of their breathing. So um, just going on to another case, uh, this is a th three month old male. Uh, he presents with worsening persisting, uh, I don't know what I put there, but persisting biphasic stridal. Um, he's had no previous symptoms and is feeding well, but recently has had increased work of breathing. Um, in terms of his past medical history, he was born at term by a normal vaginal delivery and nothing really else. So 
that's a difficult one because there's not really that much history there we're thinking about the age of the child but also the level so the type of stride or the house so biphasic meaning uh that's either at the at the glottic subglottic uh, level uh and the fact that they they're actually able to uh feed uh with no issues so unfortunately this is going back um but you'll be able to see the bit that i'm talking about and one of the things that we always have to consider in children who are stridulous um is the uh subglottic uh hemangioma. so i don't know i'll just oh, sort of replay that sorry um subglottic hemangioma so they often present after the age of three months they can be progressive so worsening uh, and they present with uh biphasic either uh uh uh, uh sorry depending on where the level is but it's usually uh subglottic uh, or glottic, uh, it can be uh, persisting uh, by, uh, by phasic stridor. Um, and those children uh, are usually first line treated with uh, propranolol, uh, but there are, of course, other treatment options. So those include a tracheostomy if it's a very significant and acute presentation, uh, it can be surgical resection, cold steel, or uh, with laser. Um, and again, I, I think it's important. Uh, to monitor those children closely because they can be, um, hemangiomas can be uh, resistant to the propranol, in which case they can continue to grow and children can progress. So we would normally see these children uh, two years after the uh, hemangioma has uh, stopped uh, progressing with uh, sequential, sequential MLBs. Um, so just going through another case, um, I'm really sorry if I'm rushing through, hopefully not, and hopefully you're <clears throat> kind of following my pattern of thinking. Um, this is a four-year-old uh, female, and she's had a long-standing history of false voice. She actually came to ENT clinic, um, and uh, she was told to sort of not shout, to have really good voice hygiene, uh, to... Um, be told you know for the teachers to be told to be patient with her and to to, to, to speak to her face to face um, and she was referred to speech and language therapy for her in, for their input she was eating and drinking absolutely fine and no problems from that point of view but recently mom has noticed that there's also some noisy breathing as well as her hoarse voice not improving and she's otherwise fit and well so <clears throat> In terms of hoarse voice, um, obviously that makes me think of something that's kind of glottic level, um, but also uh, the fact that it's stridulous and the stridor has started makes me think that the, whatever is there, whatever lesion is there, is increasing in size. So just to, to show you, so um, you'll be able to actually see, hopefully, to the two vocal cords, so you can only see on the right side um the posterior third of it and then anteriorly you can see a large uh respiratory papilloma uh, which takes up the uh area where the anterior two-thirds of the vocal cord is and then i always look just the glottis just to check and make sure that it doesn't extend any further this child is known um to us so i would normally do a full and we obviously if this was the first time we're seeing a child like that but the respiratory papillomas are always important to exclude in children who um, are having persistent or any laryngeal lesion, uh, persistent hoarse voice, uh, as well as the stridor. Okay, so we'll just move on to a slightly uh, different part of the uh, larynx. So this is a six month old male. Um, He's had coughing and choking on feed since he was born and has required NG feeding until his three months uh, uh, until three months of life uh, due to failure to thrive. He's actually had intermittent stridor, but uh, even though uh, he's no longer NG fed, he's really struggling and he's coughing and choking. And the speech and language therapists have actually referred him on to us uh, because he's, he's still having ongoing problems with his swallowing as unsafe swallow. He was born at 36 weeks, normal vagina delivery, and nothing really else to talk about. He's been on omeprazole um, because one of the um, things uh, that uh, has been considered is, is potential reflux. 
So with coughing and choking, I always think about what structural aspects can impair. So obviously there are lots of different reasons why a child would be coughing and choking with feeding. Um, it can be to do with coordination and all sorts of things, neurological status. But structurally as an ENT surgeon, the things that, that can impact that, um, we talked about vocal cord function, uh, but also uh, laryngeal um, and tracheal clefts uh, and uh, tracheosophageal fistulas as well. So I'm just going to show you hopefully these two videos. Uh, so just looking obviously the same sort of anatomy, the epiglottis, you can see the two vocal cords and you're starting to see with the probe that as you sort of put it in, uh, it's sort of dips in and it sinks in on that side. So it doesn't look like much, but you can definitely see that there is a uh, dip there. So I'm just gonna show you the other video. Uh, and that's just using the cord spreaders to try and spread the back of the larynx to see what's been happening. And you'll be able to see now as it spreads the bit that we're all talking about. Not all of us, just me. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that. So there's lots of redundant mucosa, but actually there's a, a big gap there um, that goes below the level of the vocal cords. Um, and that's important to identify at the, at the time of the MLB. And obviously the majority of children have a normal, um, normal interagenoid uh, depth, uh, but some children may have uh, a, um, a, a much deeper one. Um, one of the things that I get asked on a regular basis, and there's something that I was very interested in, uh, is the difference between a type one laryngeal cleft and a notch. Um, and that's a very controversial issue because um, there isn't a right or wrong answer and people do different things um, in that situation. Um, when I went to America, one of the things that that's sort of how they differentiate is any child uh, that aspirates uh, and has a deep interitinoid notch is classed as type 1 cleft and it gets surgically repaired there. Um, but... Um, but in, in the UK, uh, some people are a bit more conservative um, and um, it's much more managed conservatively until they, 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 they grow out of it unless they don't improve and it, and it doesn't improve. Okay, we're making our way through. So the next case is a five month old male, um, recurrent episodes of cyanosis on feeding uh, with no stride or sturtle. Um, they do have a history of reflux, but they are gaining weight and doing well. Um, in terms of their past medical history, they're born at term by normal vaginal delivery and did not require any special care when they were born. They didn't require intubation or ventilation. So I will just play you the video. Okay, and hopefully what you can see is starting to see a little narrowing, both from the tracheolus, but also some compression externally from the top. Okay, um, and I was looking, I had a really good video of trachea Malaysia, but this is what this is. Um, so this, this really hopefully gives you an idea, and there's obviously a spectrum, uh, and sometimes there's complete collapse, and you can't pass the, the collapse. This is less significant, but still very noticeable. Malaysia of the trachea and the reason why I would think about trachea Malaysia in children is these recurrent episodes of cyanosis during feeding so they often uh, feed um, they can cry they they become cyanotic on crying uh, but they don't often have uh, stride or stertor they may have some work of breathing which can be a, again a sign to look out for um, but they don't always have that so it may be just the times where the stre they're distressed or when they're feeding uh, when symptoms really become prominent okay um, and this is you'll be pleased to hear the last case so this is a six month old male um, he had a witness coughing or choking episode uh, when he was playing with his older brother um, and mum was concerned, brought him to a &E an hour later because he had 
ongoing stridal, um, um, stridal drooling and increased work of breathing. So um, we talked about sort of infective causes of stridal like epiglottitis. Um, again, the history should hopefully give you an indication as to what, um, what the issue is. Um, and the fact that it's a short duration, um, it's a witness coughing, choking episode, um, will make you think of hopefully a foreign body in the airway until proven otherwise. Again, unfortunately, I'm really sorry I don't have a video of it. I've been trying all day to try and get this video for you guys. Um, but hopefully you would have seen uh, at least one foreign body uh, being taken out of the airway. And usually it gets stuck in the right uh, main bronchus. Um, I think there are important things to bear in mind about uh, foreign bodies in the airway. Um, I think we talked about sort of history and really gauging about um, when should the patient be taken to theatre. If it's in the middle of the night, should they go to theatre or not? Um, and it's a, it's a difficult decision. I think if they are not stable, if, they are, if there's a clear history and they are uh, very symptomatic, they're desaturating, they're having blue spells, um, if the foreign body is a battery, um, those are things that you can't really wait for until uh, the following day. But if the child is relatively stable, it's a long-standing history, then that may be something that can wait overnight. I think before you take a child to theatre, I think it's important to be familiar with your um, MLB set and your emergency um, foreign body set. So, um, and that would involve a bronchoscope, and we talked about choosing the appropriate side of bronchoscope for the child that you're operating on. And it's important for you to be able to put a bronchoscope together yourself because in the middle of the night, if you're needing to do it, you may not be able to, um, to, to get somebody who's able to do that. I think the other thing that's really important is to really take your time. So not to, when you see the foreign body, it's often really exciting and you just want to get it out um, and it's important to really take your time so to uh, to to give local anesthetics so that the child doesn't cough as soon as you get down to the carina that you do give adrenaline and you put adrenaline around the foreign body often if it's something like a peanut there will be some um, granulation reaction around it so it's important to uh, to put adrenaline to, to give the adrenaline and the medication time to work Okay, um, and then to pick the appropriate uh, forceps, we have two here, so the peanut grabber and the crocodile forceps, um, um, and and really once you have a grip of it, uh, particularly if it's really um, too big to bring through the bronchoscope, is really to have a really really good grip and then pull back um, together with the bronchoscope, very very gently, taking your time so that you don't drop it. One of the things that can happen is it can drop. Of course, it can drop anyway, but to give it the best shot, the best shot is the first shot. So um, giving it the best shot the first time you do it. Okay. Hopefully this is the end. Um, but are there any questions? Thank you very much for this fantastic lecture. I have just passed my exam and it is just for the training that the exam would be quite similar to what we have seen in this fantastic lecture. Thank you very much. I, I just my question will be regarding removal of recurrent respiratory babylimitosis. Yeah. After the point you will see the children uh, after the operation, will you always see them in theaters? And how frequent, every six weeks, eight weeks, or you will see them in the clinic and decide if they need more sessions or not? Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um. I think every child is different um, and I think it's important to uh, sort of assess each child. So we have some children who come in every month um, who need to have the uh, respiratory papillomas uh, debrided. Uh, we also have those children are the ones also who have sidofovir injections. Um, there are, and there are some children who come every six, every three months, every six months. Um, generally, um, I would, if to start seeing a patient um, as a new patient, I would probably uh, see them in clinic. I would do an MLB, MLB and I would probably bring them back uh, four to six weeks later and, uh, uh, and, and make an assessment and, and, and decide how significant the, uh, 
the growth has been, the regrowth has been. Um, generally, the parents become very, very um, aware of everything and um, they will call you if there are issues uh, with regards to um, with regards to their child. So as soon as they notice any change in voice or, or any stride, or they would normally contact. So it's kind of a more of an open door policy rather than needing, uh, you know, they would have their regular dates. So it's really difficult to answer. Every child is different. Thanks for Anything that. Else? Uh, we've got, I think, Mr. Wong asking a question. Um, I've got two questions. First, if if you've been using Gardasil in the uh, RRP patients. And secondly, can you just go through the, um, the adrenaline that you use in your MLB again, please? A bronchoscopy, yes, sorry. Sure. So um, in terms of Gardasil, we haven't got a departmental policy with regards to that. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a few children who, have, who also have Sidoprovir uh, that's injected on a regular basis. And for those children, we have given them the Gardasil, male and female Gardasil vaccines, uh, obviously with parental consent. The discussion and the decision from our infectious diseases team was that it's not um, going to cause any harm, but it may not help. So we felt that it was particularly for those children to give, to give the Gardasil. However, we haven't given it we haven't made a decision to give it to all our children with RRP at the moment. So it's only been reserved for the ones that come on a regular basis. Okay. And sorry, the other question was about adrenaline. So with the adrenaline, um, so with the foreign, so if you're excising a lesion on the larynx or the subglottis, we often have um, neuropathies that we soak one in, uh, one in uh, 10,000 adrenaline on, and then you can use that. If you were using a bronchoscope and the foreign body was down the left or right main bronchus, we would normally put the bronchoscope down and we would use the spaghetti suction. And through the spaghetti suction, uh, we would in infiltrate some lignocaine and then some adrenaline. Um, and obviously you'll have to kind of think about the weight of the child, but um, you would sort of liberally, uh, you know, uh, apply it and then wait for it to work. Uh, and then try and get the foreign body out. Great, thank you. Thanks, Lily. Yeah, anything else? Anyone else? Hi, hi. Uh, Lily, great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, brilliant uh, presentation. I had a quick question. It seems to be all the questions are about RRP, but are we likely to see uh, in the next 20 years a massive reduction after the children are immunized or not? So I think we are hoping that, yes, we will see for the for the children from now on that that are coming through will not have it um, i think that there are lots of um for the children that we're giving at the moment i think that's unlikely to really make a huge difference for those children but for the ones that are uh, being born uh, as the vaccine is is being applied to 12 year olds you know hopefully that will trigger down the the hope is that it will eradicate um hpv but obviously uh, i think there'll be lots of parents who may not who may choose not to vaccinate their children and things. So we, I think we'll still see, see it. And I guess that's in the old age group um, as well. Uh, well, otherwise, I was only going to say thank you so much again. A huge reach tonight to 43 participants. I think there were up to 50 at one point I saw. So um, brilliant. Well done. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Lily. I think we've got a lot of positive uh, comments there in the chat, and I'll save that for you as well.